rooted and grounded in Jesus. And we're in part three at this time. So let's go there. Blessed is the man, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Blessed is the man who walks, and woman, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. I like that verse. A tree planted by waters. And so today we're going to talk about this. God wants us to be planted in such a way, in a place where we can be the best we can be. Right? He wants us to be in an environment, in a place where we can be the best that we can be. So we're going to uh, continue this series. Remember that the last time we talked about, we were talking about the first time, soils. And remember, Jesus told a parable or a story <coughs> about soils. And it says that a sower went out, it's in Matthew chapter 13, a sower went out to plant. The soil kind of represents our environment. That's what we, we, where we're planted. Think of yourself as a plant or a tree and where you're planted is your environment, okay? So let's read Matthew chapter 13. Let's see if we can get to the next one. Remember in Matthew 13, he says, a sower went out to sow and he cast the seed and some of it landed on the path where the birds came and ate it up, right? So it didn't even get a chance to germinate or set down roots. The second one it fell on rocky soil. Well, rocky soil, the seed sprouted and germinated very quickly, got up, but when the hot sun came out, the rocks got hot and burned and singed them. Well, you know, I don't know if you've noticed it's trees around here since we've had that real hot spell. There was, um, I've never seen it before. I've never seen the fir trees and the, you know, trees get scorched and they are scorched. You'll see uh, that they're brown. So that's kind of the things what happened to the rocky soil is, is that these things sprouted up, these plants sprouted up and then they were scorched. And then the third is that some fell, some of the seed fell on thorny ground. Okay, when the weeds came up and choked them out and, and took over. Sounds like my garden, you know, the weeds took over. And then some of that seed fell on good ground where the Bible, where it says that the soil, that they sprouted and some was able to uh, ten, tenfold, thirtyfold, sixtyfold, hundredfold. There were, different, uh, that there were different crops that came up. So that's the so soil. Now, one of the things that we talked about, and I'm going to try to hurry through this because we've done this before, but this soils, as Jesus is talking about, maybe our environment, where we're in. Now, where we're planted as, as a person. Now, there are some things that we realize that there are some things, um, and here's what we've been talking about. We have the roots, we have the soil, we have the body of the tree, and then the fruit. We've talked about the, the roots and soil already, but the soils, we talked about there. There are some things in life, there are some things in life what you and I can't control, where we're planted, where we, our environment, where we are. We, we, can't, we can't control where, when, we were, when and where we were born, right? We can't control our genetics, our parents, our family, early health, culture, economy, world. There are some things that... And how many of you notice that there are some things just out of your control, right? Anyone you notice that? The older you get, you begin to think, boy, is there anything that I can control? So those are, those are environmental situations where, you know, we can't control it. But there are some things that we learn that you can control. One is your attitude. One is the choices that you make in life. The words that you speak or hear. The friends that you make and interests, input, principles and character. Those are things that you can control that can change the environment. Just like if you have a farmer has soil that's, you know, not real good, 
He can work the soil by the decisions he makes and fertilize and, and put some things into it that will make it good soil. So the same thing. There are some things that we can control with, our, with the soil. And so that's what we're going to... Today we're going... And I'm going to go about with roots. The next one with roots. What, last time we were together, we talked about roots. What do roots do? Well, we found out that roots absorb water and minerals from the soil. Also... It anchors and supports the tree and plant. It transports water and nutrients up the plant, right, to the, to the branches and to leaves. It also, this was what was interesting to me, I never knew that the plant will store water. And we remember we learned that sometimes an orchardist or a person who has an orchard sometimes will take the young plants and shock them by not watering them so that their roots will go deep to find water. And sometimes in life, we have troubles in our lives and stresses that we go through in our life and should help us to have our roots go deeper. Well, deeper where? Well, we learned also that deep roots protect from trouble, difficult times and problems. If you've been through it once, it's easier maybe to go through it again because you trust God. Persecution, the attack of others, temptation, times of weakness. This is what deep roots will do to not only help a tree, but help us in life. And so this was what uh, the Matthew 13, listen, a farmer went out to plant the seeds, and as he scattered them across the field, some seeds fell on the footpath, and the birds came. But I wanted to share with you this part. Other seeds fell in the shallow soil, and the with underlying rock, and the seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plants soon wilted under the hot sun. Since they did not have deep roots, they died. Okay? And I want to go with this one. Did you know, and we learned this last time, that the Bible refers to Jesus as a root in several places in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Did you know that? He is called the root. And what's interesting about that, we learned last time, was something called grafting. How many have heard of grafting? Okay. Grafting is two different, uh, it has the rootstock and the scion. Okay. The scion is what the, is the nice tender root at the top. You can see there at the top there is the nice area right there on the top. And those two shoots go into the rootstock. And those two things, those two branches there will grow together as an, into one. And you see this a lot maybe in, in Northern California, right? That's right. Because this is what you'll see down there in California. They take English walnut and graft it to the rootstock of a black walnut. Black walnuts have a, uh, a more hardy, they're, they're more uh, adapted to that area and will do well. And the English wal walnut is a well, my dad would disagree with is a better tasting nut. <laughs> my dad loves black walnuts. But that's what you'll see down there is this grafted together. And as we learned last time, what was interesting about this is that as believers, we become grafted into Jesus so that he becomes our strong and stable root. Amen? Isn't that beautiful? The analogy that we get from this, this parable that Jesus taught is these roots if we're rooted, if we're grafted into Jesus. In fact, Jesus even says this. Jesus said in John, As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that will bear much fruit. For apart me you can do what? Nothing. John 4, 15, 4 and 5. So today, that was what the soils were and the roots. That's what we got. So I'm caught you up. And now we're going to be talking about the tree itself, the plant itself, what we can see, okay? And so we're going to hear from there. And um, going through this, I want you to know that each of us are unique and special. And so the tree is our identity or uniqueness and our value okay the tree now just remember that as we go through this so we are unique and special 
And here are some things that I want you to know. That's me. I like to water ski. I like to snow ski. I like activities like that. I was privileged to have a father who encouraged that kind of stuff and taught me how to do these things. And, and uh, that, that's part of who I am, right? I also like to hike with my son. We hiked uh, this summer. We did this hike up Table Mountain. And you can see in the background, you can see uh, Mount Adams and Mount Rainier and uh, Mount St. Helens, if I blew it up a little farther. I love to hike, but I don't like to just hike. I like to hike up a mountain. I like to get up high. So that's kind of who I am. And um, I also like to work with my hands. Um, Greg knows that because I came up and we helped build a barn together uh, up at his place. But I did this at my daughter at her barn up in Aberdeen. And I put these, he, there was nothing there before, and I, she asked me to put some stalls in for her horses. And so I didn't know what the, I was doing. John, I had not a clue what I was doing. But I, you know, it's like my grandsons taught me. Just go to YouTube, Grandpa. You can, you can do anything. It shows you what to do. So I did, and this is what I came up with. And so that's... That's part of me. That's who I am. I like working with my hands and working with wood. I built those doors. Those were, I have no idea how to build those doors, but boy, it's amazing what you can find on YouTube, right? So, and then also I love to spend time with my grandkids. We were talking about that this morning in Sabbath school. Uh, that's part of my identity. That's part of who I am is those, those kids who I love to just play with. This was time, they're a lot older but uh, now, but... And then I love to spend time with my wife, Pam, and hike on the beach and, and spend time together. That's just, that's just who I am. That's part of my uniqueness. That's, and so I share that with you. And I'm going to also share, and I want, this is a children's story now, okay? We're going to switch to the children's story. You ready for this, okay? Did you know, Grace and Mason, that there are 60,000 different types of trees in the world? Did you know that? What's your favorite tree? Do you have a favorite tree, Grace? No? How about you, Mason? You got a few trees in your yard, I know, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to share with you some of these trees, okay? This is called a what? Anybody know or recognize this? A blue spruce. We're familiar with that in the northwest here. A blue spruce. Why is it called a blue spruce? Because it looks blue. Boy, that was... Yeah, it does. Now, what are this kind of tree? It's a what? Sequoia or redwood, right? This looks like coastal redwoods, but they are, and sequoias are, are relatives of those trees. Uh, they're different. The, the redwoods, the coastal redwoods, will grow somewhere around the tallest trees in the world, 250 feet tall, okay? The sequoias are not as tall. They get up to 200 feet or so. They're not as tall, but they are massive around right at the base massive around so you can drive a car through them that's how massive they are man huge trees anybody know what this kind of tree is i have one of these in my my yard my front yard yes or corkscrew willow or whatever it's called i love this tree it's so unique the branches grow all curly like this it's like somebody gave it a perm you know now, anybody recognize this? This, what is it? Do you know what this tree is? It's a bristle cone pine. Now, there's interesting about the. This is the, this is the oldest living thing on Earth. These bristle cone pines were around when the Egyptians were building the pyramids. That's how old they. Some of these. These bristle cone points are 4,000 years old. 4,000 years old. Isn't that pretty? Anybody know what these trees are? Anybody? You know what these trees are? You can see them in California, all over Australia. Jacaranda trees. Yes. In the spring, that's what they look like. Beautiful. And it's and it, uh, just a beautiful purple tree. And it's, uh, we have one around here, too. I think I've seen one around here somewhere. Um, what is this? Anybody know? 
It's a Japanese maple. We have those around here. It's a beautiful, probably some people would consider this the most beautiful tree ever, okay? It's just the most beautiful tree. But look at how different these trees are, right? Some are huge and big and some are massive. Some are small and petite and beautiful in colors. Just different. What is this one? Can you know what this one is, Mason? No. We don't have them around here. They're in Africa. And in Australia, they have a few, as David Ashrick said. It's a boabab tree. A boabab tree. And it's usually in an arid climate, and that trunk is full of water. Okay? So it can store a lot of water, right? So it can survive in a, in a very arid area. Really strange tree. But you'll like this one. I think you'll like, Mason, you'll like the name of this one better. Do you know what the name of this one is? It grows in the Middle East, in the desert, on the coast, you know, and, and uh, in Yemen, along the coast there. It's right there on the coast, but it's in a desert area. You know what they call this? It's the dragon blood tree. And do you know why they call it the dragon blood tree? Because if you cut it open, the sap is red like blood, Okay. So you don't know if you get cut on it, whether it's yours or the trees. So, But it, what's unique about this tree is it's in a desert. How does it survive in the desert? Well, here's what happens. Is that it, because it's on the coast, you know, here on our coast, what happens in night is a, in the evening time, the coastal mist comes in. This tree survives on the mist that comes in from the ocean every night. That's how it gets its water. It's the only way it survives. So there's that yew tree. Now these are some trees that we have right here. What is this? Close? Well, it's a family. Western cedar. This is western cedars. Okay, we know that. This is unique because we have this and only one other place in the world has this in the northwest. It is the what? The myrtlewood tree. Right along the Oregon coast. Nowhere else does it grow except for in Israel. We have something in common with Israel. This is the largest myrtle wood in Oregon. It's 85, 88 feet high, 42 feet around, and 70 feet wide at the canopy. Isn't that amazing? I didn't even know they grew that big. And that's what a myrtle wood looks like. A lot smaller here, that one. This is my, one of my favorite trees. Anybody know what this is? We have them around here once in a while, but mostly along the coast. It's a madrona tree, a madrona. What's unique about it is, it's, is, is it strips off its bark every year, okay? And then underneath that bark is this beautiful red color bark. It's smooth, okay? It's, a, it's in the family, same family as the manzanita, if you know that in California. Manzanita grows a lot in California, so it's in the same family, but these are much bigger. And this is my very favorite tree, Mason and Grace, my very favorite tree. Can you tell me what it is? We have them on the eastern side of the mountains. Ponderosa pine. The Ponderosa Pine. I used to watch Bonanza. That's why I liked it. Ponderosa Pine. Growing up. Grows big. What is this? Vine Maple. Our own Vine Maple. It's beautiful. And then we're going to have some more colorful trees. What is this? It's Aspen. We have some Aspen. My neighbor has Aspen across the, uh, from it. It turns bright yellow in the fall. And uh, the bark is like a birch bark. And it's just beautiful, beautiful. In Colorado, you can just, in the fall, it's just absolute gorgeous. This is a beautiful tree, isn't it? Do you like this tree, Grace? Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. This is, this is in Japan. It's a, anybody know? Wisteria tree. That's right. It's a wisteria. I had had wisteria, and you know, I've grown wisteria, but I didn't know they grew into a tree. It's a huge tree. Now, oh. What kind of eucalyptus? Rainbow. Rainbow eucalyptus. Have you ever seen this? I never saw this before. Isn't that amazing? The bark like that? Eucalyptus bark is a little, uh, is a little smoother too. But boy, I never saw 
uh, something like that. So I want you to know this, Grace and Mason. There is no such thing as an average tree. Out of 60,000 different trees, even if they're in the same family, in other words, even if you have two redwoods, they're going to be different because they're not growing in the same spot. And they may not have different environments and different things that they go. So what I'm trying to tell you is there's no average tree, which means, which means there is no average person. There, you are one of a kind, Mason. Did you know that? There's only one Mason in the universe. Thank heavens. <laughs> oh, I think that's special. Grace, there's only one of you, right? Only one. So that's what I'm going to share with you today, a little bit more about this. And I'm going to, hopefully, can I go over a little bit? It's all right. I have so much to give you, so, so wait patiently there for me, and I'll, I'll get through this. This is a story that in the late 40s and early 50s, they were developing jet aircraft. They were replacing the old prop planes from World War II, and they were going to jet aircraft. They were looking at transitioning, but what they were finding is, is that they were crashing all the time. And that's not really good to be in a plane and it's crashing, right? So all of these new jets that they were developing were crashing all the time. In fact, one day, in one day, there was 17 crashes. And these weren't in, in battle like in the Korean War. These were not wartime. These were just practice runs. And they were crashing these planes. Well, that gets pretty expensive. And so the, you know, the top brass in the military were trying to figure out what was going. So they did some research. They did some study. Why are these planes crashing? Uh, and so they were looking through all the things. Could it be this? And could it be that? And they found there was no rhyme or reason to all of the incidents when they were crashing. And uh, so they had determined that it must be what? pilot air but these were experienced World War II pilots that knew what they were doing well they brought in somebody a Harvard graduate by the name of Gilbert Daniels he did a study about it and then he came up with a hypothesis of what could be causing these accidents and so what he found was is that they had taken, when they designed these jet engines, they had designed the cockpit, and the fuselage had to be a certain, they only had a certain amount of space on these jets, these developing jets, and the cockpit was of just a standard size, or average size. So what they did is they took, a, the av they took measurements of all the different, about 4,000 pilots, and they took those measurements of all these pilots, and then they took the average, and then they designed the cockpit for the average pilot. And what Gilbert Daniels was saying, this Harvard graduate, he was saying, that's not working. That's what's causing the, ca the, 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 uh, the crashes. And so what he said is what you need to do is you need to build cockpits for each for small pilots, medium pilots, large pilots, extra large pilots, extra, extra large pilots. And so they decided, well, that's a lot, even though it may be expensive, it's a lot cheaper than crashing planes all the time. Right? So that's what they began to do. And do you know that immediately the crashes stopped? They, and so this is the conclusion that he came to. The tendency to think in terms of the average man is a pitfall into which many persons blunder. It is virtually impossible to find an average person, not because of any unique traits in this group, but because of the great variability of bodily dimensions which is characteristic of all men. So this tendency to think in terms of average is, could be called the flaw of averages. You've heard of the law of averages? Well, this could be called the flaw of averages. In fact, Todd Rose is the one who told this story of Gilbert Daniels. 
in his book, The End of Average, by Todd Rose, unlocking our potential by embracing what makes us different. Okay? And so he tells a story in his book about Norma for normal. This was a OBGYN doctor who decided that he, he was also a sculpturer and he decided to do a project of sculpturing the perfect woman or the normal woman or the average woman and so he took, had, took measurements or had uh, women submit measurements 15,000 women took measurements, all these different measurements of height, their arm length, their, their width, all of these different measurements, and then he averaged it all together and created this statue called Norma. Well, someone got the bright idea, this ideal woman, that they were going to find the ideal woman. So in this, you can find it today in the Health Museum at Cleveland. You can see Norma, and I think there's also a man there that he sculptured as well. But it says here in this, that, and you, it was on Time and in, uh, in the magazine Time and, and CBS newspapers. But what they did, someone got the bright idea in Cleveland to take and make a contest out of it before they revealed Norma. So what they did is they had people... Um, call in or write in and put their all their different measurements all these women put their different measurements because they were going to find the ideal woman the, the the average woman this woman they were going to find that person and so these people were uh over almost four thousand women participated for the prizes that they were going to good so they started submitting their measurements and there was i think about nine different measurements that they were taking okay and this is what they found in this, and this was in the early, the 40s and uh, early 50s, and here's what they found. Before the competition, the judges assumed most entrance measurements would be pretty close to the average, and that the contest would come down to a question of millimeters. But the reality turned out to be nothing of the sort. Less than 40 out of 3,864 contestants were average size on just five of the nine dimensions, and none of the contestants came close to on all of the dimensions. Didn't even come close. What does that tell you? Well, just as Daniel's study, right? Daniel's the, the researcher for the Air Force revealed that there was no such thing as an average size pilot, the normal look-alike contest demonstrated that the average sized woman did not exist either. So ladies, why are you trying to find or be like them? It doesn't exist. There is no such thing, my friends, as an average body. Right? You are unique. You are special just the way you are. And so there is no such thing as an average, what, person. I'm going to take you to the human brain now. The human brain. An amazing, and I, we've got medical people here. Dr. Scribner is here. The human brain, the neural pathways. There's 100 to 200 billion not million, billion neurons, the cells in the, the nerve cells in the, in, the, in the brain. 100 to 200 billion. And the neural pathways are astronomical. That's the neural pathways is like, for instance, if you're trying to learn something, okay, that you're, um, for instance, when you learned as a kid to ride a bike, right, you're neurons will start firing and they will sort through the path to find the right way to know how to ride the bike or if you learn to do a flip or a dive or something or even to talk your your mind and your body it, those neurons are firing to find that neural pathway so that you can do that what you are learning to do. That's what learning is all about. That's why repetition is the mother of learning because your mind is finding the right path 
to make that happen to coordinate with and telling your body what it needs to do to, to accomplish that. So I'm going to give you a number here. 10 to the 81st power. That's a 1 with 81 zeros after it. That's a big number, isn't it? I can't even imagine that number. Scientists tell us that this is their estimate to how many atoms are in the universe. Atoms, okay? okay atoms are the, what build the building blocks of matter. And this is what their estimate. In the known universe, there are 10 to the 81st power atoms in the whole universe. That's a big number. Can't even imagine, okay? I'm going to give you another number here. This is 10 to the 121st power, or uh, one with 121 zeros after it. A much larger number, significant larger number, than the whole known universe. This number, if you're wondering, is the number of potential neural pathways in your brain. Your brain is set up to, and we only use, some of us less than others, only 10% of our brain. <laughs> you know. But the point is, it has the potential of being neural pathways, the different neural pathways and things to learn. That's why I think that when we get to heaven, we'll be learning about things throughout eternity. I mean, there's a lot of space in there, right? A lot of pathways it can do to learn different things. Maybe I can learn Spanish one of these days. <laughs> I'm working on it, but my pathways aren't as nimble as they used to be. Isn't that amazing? Now, to continue that, the human brain is by far the most complex thing that we know of. Of all the organs, and Greg, you can, uh, you can um, um, correct me if I'm wrong, of all the organs of the body, we know the least about the brain. It's just so complicated. We've made, we made strides to learn more and more about it, or I wouldn't have been able to share this with you. But in the University of California in Santa Barbara, a study on the av they were studying to find the average brain. You know, it's never been proven that if you have a bigger brain or a smaller brain that that is, has anything to do with your intelligence because Albert Einstein had a below average size brain, okay? And as far as I know, he was pretty intelligent. But the University of California at Santa Barbara studied the, on, did a study on the average brain. They were going to find that. And so what they did is they had... 16 people do the same identical task, whether it was um, uh, putting, uh, sorting out different colored pins in a certain order, or whether it was uh, to uh, do dot to dot. Whatever it was, they did exactly the same uh, event. They did the same thing, okay? Then they took images of the brain as they were doing it to find out where certain things were being, where the neurons were firing. What part of the brain was, 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 were they using to do this? Did you know that they found, out of all 16, none of them, none of those images of the brain were the same? Doing the exact same thing, but none of them were the same. And so they composited it all and said this is the average brain, but it was so unique. So in other words, they discovered there's no such thing as a what? Average brain. There's no such thing. A focus on average fosters competition and comparison. We have this idea that, in fact, our society does that too, doesn't it? We compare ourselves all the time, thinking, well, if I was just more pretty, if I was stronger, if I was this, or if I was that. But a focus on individuality fosters what? Creativity. And Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. We do not have the audacity, he says, to put ourselves in the same class or compare ourselves with some 
who brag about themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves, they lack wisdom and behave like fools. In other words, when we're trying to be someone that we're not, we lack wisdom and we behave like fools. Because there's no such thing as an average person. And nobody wants to be below average, right? I was talking to, to Yogi and uh, Ben Merklin, and we were talking there, and they were talking about and comparing their IQs. One had a higher IQ than the other one. Okay? So we're always comparing, and nobody wants to have a low, below average IQ, right? Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to have be a, you know, a below average when it comes to strength or whatever. We don't want to be that way. But I'm not talking about, I'm talking about comparison. I'm not talking about the competition that we do when we're playing table games or playing games, basketball or football or whatever. Those kinds of things are fine until you start placing value on yourself and comparing yourself to others. When I was in high school, I liked to play basketball and all kinds of different sports. And one of the things that I learned is, is that I always compare myself to the being the best that I can be. I didn't worry about what they did or what so-and-so did or try to be, be like Mike, like Michael Jordan. I knew I was going to be like Michael Jordan, right? but I could be the best me I could be. And that's what I'm talking about. In fact, in this, it's built right into Jesus' parable. Did you know that? Our uniqueness. Because it says, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell upon the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately sprang up, and since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had not root, they withered away. Other seeds fell upon among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Now listen to this. Built right in. Other seeds fell on the good soil and produced grain, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. Do you see? That even built in the story, there is this, this uniqueness that we all are different, and difference is good. I, want to, I don't usually quote Dr. Seuss, but I'm going to do it today, okay? Is that all right? Okay. Dr. Seuss says this. There's the cat in the hat. Today you are you. That is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. You are unique. You are special. So I want to talk to you about worth and value. What are you worth? What's your value? Um, David Asherick and his wife went to this place. It was a museum on bonsai trees. How many, do any of you have bonsai trees? Okay. Um, it takes a lot of care, right? I mean, bonsai trees, you just don't let it sit and hope it takes care of itself. You have to be, in fact, the people that do bonsai growing are so meticulous about everything, they have even little tools that, are, you, that they have so that you can trim the bark and trim the branches and train and do this. And, and Carolyn, you can probably tell me all the different things. The soil has to be a certain way, right? Certain temperature in the room, humidity. There's all kinds of things that go into forming these bonsai trees. And these are trees that normally, if they were out in the wild, would be these huge redwoods or big trees but they were able to miniaturize them in this, this meticulous way that they, they care for these trees. And they're so different. They're all different. You can do it to just about any tree, I think. And it's amazing how meticulous that they do. So here's, here's one of the trees here. It's a beautiful tree, isn't it? And, uh, and this, on, the, on my left, your right, that tree is a redwood. It's probably only about this tall, right? It looks huge, doesn't it? In fact, I wonder if they use bonsai trees in movie sets or whatever so that they make it look that way. But, uh, but here's a guy who's meticulously watching over this, this tree. The interesting thing about these trees, and this was really interesting to me, not only do they have bonsai trees, but they have bonsai forests. Here's a bonsai forest, right? It's amazing, isn't it? All these little trees in the form of, and it's only about 
this big, about the size of a couple of basketballs. And you have a, a little miniature forest there. I thought that was quite interesting. Here's the oldest, the world's oldest bonsai tree. It's a thousand years old. A thousand years old, okay? Do you know what that means? That there has been bonsai growers for generation after generation after generation taking, who have dedicated themselves to taking care of this tree for a thousand years. You're in trouble if your son or daughter doesn't want to take care of the tree, right? So much for that. Or maybe it's been changed from one family to another. I don't know. But a thousand years old? A thousand years old? You know, some of these trees can range from, um, you know, hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars. Okay? And you would think a tree like this, a thousand-year-old tree, bonsai tree like this, if you were Jeff Bezos or, or Bill Gates or whatever, you could come and lay down a few million dollars for this tree. But you know what? This tree is not for sale. Why? You'll never be able to replace it. You can't just call up Amazon and order one, right? This is irreplaceable. It is priceless. The oldest bonsai tree. It's priceless. So the value of something is determined by the one who's willing to pay the price. And you know what? There is no such thing as an average tree. There's no such thing as an average pilot. There's no such thing as an average body. There's no such thing as an average brain. And there's no such thing as an average person. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. Because you are one of a kind. You are uniquely equipped to contribute to the lives of others and to the world around you in ways that no one else can. You add to the universe something that can never be replaced. Do you feel special? In fact, because you are wonderful, you are irreplaceable. You can love and be loved in a way that no one else ever has been or ever will be. You're one of a kind. There is no one like you. God has a relationship with you that he will never have with anybody else, ever, forever. Can you imagine what will happen when, when, he, when the wicked are destroyed, what's going to do to the heart of God? All of those people who rejected him, it'll just break his heart. And what a loss it is to the universe. You are wonderful because you are unique in your path in life learning, growth, and healing are unique only to you. You are not average. You're unique. You're wonderful. And you're priceless. In fact, God loves you and values you so much, he values you more than his own life. Let that sink in. God values you more than his own life. And you are to God irreplaceable and infinite value. Yes, you. So, going back to Psalms. A Christian, a follower of God, is like a plant, a tree planted by streams of water. And we already realize that there are many, many different trees, right? There's no tree that's the same. None. Even if you, like you said, if you have two ponderosa pines, they're different. Did you know that trees have DNA? In fact, in forensic science now, they can, they can tell 
the DNA of a tree, so where that tree is located. It has just as diff we all have different DNA, so does the tree. So no tree is the same. There's no such thing as an average tree. It's like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in season. And next time we get together, we'll talk about fruit. That will be our last uh, in this series. And its leaf does not wither. My friends, to God, you are irreplaceable. You are priceless. And he is willing to give up his, and he did, give up his own life for you so that you could spend eternity with him because God will miss you terribly if you're not. It will break his heart. So, you are unique, you are wonderful, and you're irreplaceable to God. So that places the value how we should look towards one another, is right? Because there's no such thing as an average person. You are unique. No one, no one will be like you ever, ever again. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you love us so much and you value us so much and our worth is found in you. There is no such thing as an average. We are irreplaceable. We are unique just the way we are. And our experiences that we've had in life is unique just to us. And we add, we add to the universe something special that no one else in the universe can add. I pray, Lord, that each one here today will know and realize how much you mean to them as a tree planted by streams of water we thank you thank you for loving us in Jesus name amen